Thanks for watching our podcast. Here at Spear Consulting, our services include business strategy and human resources consulting. In HR, we offer executive search, executive coaching, and work psychology consulting. Please visit us at spiritmco.com, where we fulfill our clients' dreams virtuously. Enjoy your show. Welcome back to the Leading Virtuously podcast. So excited for our guest today, Trevin. Who are you? Well, my name is Trevin Ross. Um, I am a human resources professional. I've been uh, in human resources my whole career. I actually set out and intended to go into human resources. Uh, at the time, I know a number of people probably thought that was pretty crazy, but I decided to do that anyway. Um, the last 20 years or so, um, I've been moving around in the healthcare space, uh, various payer, provider, um, you know, organizations and working with them to really strategically understand their how to utilize, best utilize their human capital, how to grow and develop, attract and retain that human capital. Um, I'm also a son. I have family in Oklahoma. They all still live there. I'm in Houston, Texas, by the way. So they're all still there. Um, great, um, wonderful uncle to nieces and nephews. And I really enjoy uh, culture, restaurants, um, you know, going out and trying out new concepts, new things, new ideas. Uh, that doesn't apply just to my personal life. That also applies to work as well. So I'm always looking for new and different and innovative ways uh, to do things. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for sharing. And uh, what are, so as you kind of mentioned, like you love culture and being able to experience mm -hmm. new things, specifically around restaurants, I find that <laughs> it, it can be a dangerous endeavor, you know, it being can able be. to go out there because uh, oftentimes you could end up going to the wrong place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, you know, but I think it is kind of lame when you just continually just pick the same restaurant over and over and over again. Yeah. Break outside uh, of your box. Absolutely. Yes, variety is definitely the spice of life, no doubt. Exactly. I agree. So mm -hmm. what's your atypical tip for, you know, looking when you're considering to go to new restaurants, et cetera, to make sure that you're limiting the number of duds that mm -hmm. you are uh, eating at? I'm sorry, say that again? What's, what tips do you have for people that are looking for new restaurants to make sure you're minimizing the number of duds that you eat at? Absolutely. Um, well, you know, I remember my dad saying um, many, many years ago that the universal sign of a good restaurant is a line. And so if you're driving past a restaurant that may have opened up and there's a line, maybe it's been open a couple of weeks, but it's always busy, you can almost guarantee that's a place with good food. Um, also, you know, there's any number of groups online and that might be everything from Yelp to Facebook to, you know, whatever, um, applications that you may use, whatever social media outlets you may use. Um, I'm on a few of them here in Houston that regularly, you know, people, um, people who are foodies tend to kind of attract other foodies mm -hmm. and love to discuss that. So I use a few of those as well. Um, I'll be honest, while I like to try new restaurants, I'm usually not the first one in line. I want a few other people to go and I want to ask them what their opinion is and what they think about it. Um, and so I'll normally be there after maybe a couple of weeks, uh, something like that. So, but I really find that that helps minimize the number of um, disappointments that I may come across. <laughs> so, uh, but I always do. I will say this, a lot of people do not physically make a drive by past the place. Mm -hmm. And usually if there's something that pops up on a feed or something like that, sometime within the first week or two, I'll make it a point to actually physically drive past the place if it's reasonable for me to do so and mm -hmm. just take a look at what's there. Sounds um, like your, your father's a wise man and <laughs> I think sounds so. similar to my wife's uh, father, my father-in-law and that they, mm -hmm. they echo the same thing about you know, if it's busy, that's usually a good sign that uh, right. you know, that the food is good, the service is good, right. it's, mm -hmm. it's quality. Absolutely. Which also makes me just kind of like poke and jest of like, if I owned a restaurant, then maybe I'd just like order an organization. Like, even if we were still trying to build to that level, right. just hire a bunch of people to like drive through the parking lot. Exactly. To make it a, That'd be a it. lot busier. Yeah, just have the whole social group come over <laughs> and, you know, hang out for an evening or something like that. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Awesome. So as we you know, dive into specifically like human resources and culture. 
What are some of the things that you know as a human resources professional as it relates to building outstanding cultures? Well, one I have always believed, I have found over my career, and it's really become cemented in my mind, that you know, building culture and having employees engaged heavily in that culture requires alignment with an employee's or requires an employee's alignment with an organization's mission, vision, and values. And creating that alignment is really what engagement is all about. Excuse me, that was coming out for a second. That's really what engagement is all about, is when the individual feels an alignment with the organization's mission, vision, and values, whatever those values are. And when we talk about leading virtuously, obviously one of the strongest factors, one of the strongest components of an employee feeling engaged and tied to that is when their leader, whether it's their manager or other leaders in the organization, are attached to that mission, vision, and values themselves and are demonstrating it every day. So when you want to talk about a strong culture, defining that mission, vision, and values, and then also assuring that your workforce is well aligned with that, whether that is through training, communication, all of those different channels, that is real, that really forms the basis for a strong organizational culture. Excellent. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing that as well, Trevin. And uh, yeah, just thinking about, you know, what you, you, what you ultimately said, the mission, vision, and values, and it, you know, that that's gotta, that's gotta come first. And then the alignment to everyone within that organization. Mm -hmm. And that the, the more that the leader over that specific department is bought in and on board with right. that, the right. more Absolutely. that the rest of that subculture within the greater organization is Absolutely. going to be fired up about the mission, vision, and values as well. So, right. so excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So before we kind of dive further, Trevin, into the virtue side of leadership, Oftentimes I find it is helpful to kind of uh, discuss through some of the maybe vices or character flaws that people have that they had to overcome in order to reach their leadership capability. So can you speak to kind of like within your own journey and your own walk, what were some of the vices that you had to overcome in order to reach your current leadership capability? Um, that's a very interesting question. I like that question. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that I have really had to overcome and have worked very hard is a focus solely on the work that I do myself and giving, working on giving credit, giving praise to whether it is my colleagues who I work with or the people on my team for the work that they have done and their contributions. And you know, as opposed to focusing on this is my work and this is what I have done, recognizing, um, appreciating, supporting and praising other people in the organization for how they have contributed to the work as a leader. I don't do all of that work myself. There are others. And again, they may be colleagues that I'm working in a collaborative relationship with. They may be people reporting to me that I manage. They may be other people in the organization with whom I have a different relationship. But for many years, particularly as I started on my career path and I was an individual contributor, of course, as an individual contributor, you're heavily focused on your own work and the work that you produce yourself. But when I moved into being a leader, I realized that that was a challenge for me and something which I really had to make an effort, a concerted effort to focus on, to say, there are other people that have contributed to whatever this success has been in our organization. Even if it's in my department, how did we collaborate together? How do I honor their contributions to what's been produced or achieving the objective, whatever that might be in the organization? And I think that's really critical um, because you know many leaders will refer to, you know, my department or my function. But there's behind that, there's the realization that all of what is being produced and all of what is being achieved and accomplished is accomplished by a much larger group of people. Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of a story where I was out with a, a vendor of mine 
and we were at a networking event and someone had asked us, you know, like, who, how do you guys know each other? And I was like, my response was, oh, we're just, we're, we're work colleagues. Mm -hmm. And he was like really touched by that. <laughs> I could have mm -hmm. easily taken the ego play and had been like, no, I'm, I'm currently his boss. I hired him to support my organization, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But to just, you know, take that loving approach of just being like looking at everyone as our mm -hmm. colleagues, regardless if they report to us or not. And exactly. it's kind of like that same kind of discipline and, and how that also like how, how people are just that much more willing to want to work with you and right. work for you if you're mm -hmm. not someone that's just constantly, you know, taking that credit and, mm -hmm. and wanting to make it all about yourself. So thank you for sharing that. Curious, Absolutely. Trevin, like where you feel like, what, what is the roots of that struggle in yourself? Like where, where do you feel like that came from in your own, your own journey? You know, that's, uh, that's yet another good question. Where that came from, you know, I, I would say I had a couple of really good mentors um, in throughout my career. And I'm very, very grateful for that. And I, I, this actually mentor was someone who did work for me. And on a particular occasion, um, I had gotten up and done a presentation to um, a large department, one of our largest departments in the organization at that time, and talked about what we in the human resources function were doing. And I talked about all of the different areas. But what I failed to do in that presentation was acknowledge the people who were working in, or even at that case, these were leaders who reported to me, the leaders of those functions. And so I had all of the contributions there, but did not provide, again, the opportunity to credit them or provide, you know, some praise for them in front of that larger group. And, you know, when you're in a large organization, I think everyone understands that you're not the sole contributor. But at the same time, you know, people want to know that you are working collaboratively. And I actually had one of my employees come and point that out to me. And that was a real turning point for me. Mm -hmm. In that conversation, I actually followed up with each of the members of each of my direct reports individually and asked them, um, you know, had I done that, had they noticed it and things like that. And when I kind of opened that door to that conversation, um, some of the others expressed the same thing. And so I may actually made an effort the next time I was doing a presentation like that. After it was created, I circulated it to all of them and said, will you please work with me on improving this presentation so that we are all presented in a light that allows us to shine as a team and as a group of collaborators, rather than just me as the leader of the human resources function at this organization. Got it. Well, well, thank you for that uh, revelation as to how it, how you how your eyes were open as mm -hmm. it related to that type of leadership approach and and yeah. and why you made the decision to to change the way that you were leading going forward. Yeah. And Trevin, I guess I was just trying to dig a, a layer deeper as to like as you think about your own life, why do you feel like that was something that was like you felt like you had to kind of do that self promotion? Was that mm -hmm. part of is can you think back to a period in your life where maybe that was beneficial mm -hmm. to, you know, basically do that self-promotion, but then mm -hmm. as you moved into that leadership journey, now you saw yeah. that, that it wasn't actually the most ideal way to be leading. Right. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's a transition. I think I'm not the only one who's moved from that transition from kind of an individual contributor role, or maybe someone who's brand new in their career you know, um, moving, you know, finishing education and moving into your first job, you know, the work that you produce um, or your own accomplishments when it comes to everything from performance evaluations to just receiving praise in front of your colleagues and things like that, um, you know, that is, that can be very beneficial at that point in one's career, in one's growth and development. Um, and for me, I can say, you know, that went back very much to, um, you know, even when I was growing up, 
um, throughout middle school and high school. I think just like everyone else, again, I don't know that I'm terribly different, but there were certain things that I did well and maybe certain things that I did not do so well. Um, I happen to do well at academics, but you compensate and you promote those things that you do well to whether that might be teachers or leaders or bosses or whomever that might be and kind of de-emphasize things that perhaps, you know, are not quite, you're not quite as skillful at achieving. And so that serves you well in that environment. And the, you know, when, while that continued to serve me well through my educational part of my development, and then in the first few years of my career, at some point that, that shifts. And again, when you move into a leadership role, and not to say that you have to manage people to be in a leadership role. I know many people who may not be in what you would call a true management role of, of managing other people, but are tremendous and amazing and humble leaders, even perhaps in a role which doesn't formally lead other people. And in working with some of those people and thinking, you know, I kind of want to be like, you know, this person over here who is just known for being a great collaborator on their team and what makes them a great collaborator on their team, because no one reports to them, um, but they're very well known and very well respected um, and, and very and honored um, on their team as someone who promotes that collaboration working together. And it's not all just about themselves. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for sharing in that regard. So, so Trevin, why do you see yourself as a virtuous leader and, and what are some of the stopping grounds of, of that formation in yourself? Well, as, as I mentioned once before, I've had a number of, of uh, blessed to have a number of good mentors and managers and bosses in my career. And there's one in particular that stands out to me um, that was, um, you know, relatively early on in my career she really managed and led and lived her own life by a four word mantra. And it was called do the right thing. Mm. And that permeated when she came to work every day. Um, I knew just from casual conversations, that's how she lived her personal life as well. And more than once, either I would be having a conversation with her or there might be a team meeting and if the question came up, what is it that we need to do? The first question was, what is the right thing to do? Well, here's what I think is the right thing to do. Well, you need to do the right thing. And the right thing may not always be what is the most financially advantageous to the organization. The right thing might mean that we have to do some more work than we might otherwise do might require more involvement, more effort from us. It might mean some difficult conversations or taking some difficult actions. But it really became very clear to me over the time that I worked with her and worked for her that if, when you really sat down and thought about it, when you ask yourself, do the right thing, in more than 90% of the cases, the answer would be pretty obvious. Mm. as to what it was you needed to do if you were approaching it from that perspective. And I have carried that with me and I have used that in my own leadership. I've used it with my own teams as well to say, what is it that we do if our intent is to do the right thing? Now a word from our sponsors. Have you been feeling unfulfilled? One of the best ways to experience joy is by caring for the homeless. A charity that I've grown to love River of Light, food rescues a million meals per year for the needy in Chicago. Imagine how that make you feel knowing that you're helping feed homeless children and veterans. To make a tax-deductible donation, please visit riveroflightchicago.org. Again, that URL is riveroflightchicago.org. No one should go to bed hungry. So, so, can you, so can you maybe break that down also to some tangible examples of, of maybe like where, where the, the choice, where you had a, a couple different choices and then mm -hmm. just like using that mantra of doing the right thing uh, on behalf of people and mm -hmm. how that, how it played itself out. 
Well, sure. Um, you know, I can think of a couple of different examples um, with um, in the human resources function. This was actually later on um, than I was no longer uh, working with that particular manager, but I had moved into another organization. And we had someone, we had an employee um, who had transferred into a new role. And so the employee had transferred into a new role and had been in that role for a period of time. And it became clear within, I would say, the first few months that this role was not a good fit for this employee. The new role was not a good fit. Everyone thought it was. The hiring manager thought it was. The employee thought it was. I thought it was. Everyone involved thought this is going to be a great move. It was also a promotion. Uh, for the employee's promotional opportunity. Well, that never but, happens, right, Trevin? Like where yeah, we put that, people in positions and then it doesn't right, work out. <laughs> right, right. And well, and the, the reason I say that is that in this organization, we had policies which were very clear and which, you know, were, you know, and rather strict about the movement of, of employees within an organization. And movement and probationary periods and anyone who's HR, anyone who's managed people kind of knows what I'm talking about. Most organizations have policies and procedures listed out around that. And in this particular situation, what had happened was an employee had moved to the pediatric unit. And the pediatric unit in this hospital um, was not um, I guess I would say it would be a very challenging place to be. We dealt with very, very ill children, very sick children, children that passed away. And many people felt that moving into pediatrics would be great because they really love children and they really like working with children and being with children. But moving into that unit was very, very hard emotionally. Uh, particularly if you do love children, because that would be extremely difficult. Children which are undergoing very challenging medical procedures um, and their families and their parents, you know, which are going through the same things, you know, roller coaster of emotions and all of those things. And the employee moved over there and realized, you know, this was not for them. And, but we had, we had a really, tough discussion because the manager at the time was very focused on what is the policy and what is the procedure that we have. Certain time periods had passed. They had passed a 90 day mark, which, you know, in our policy was kind of the return point. They'd been in there for quite a bit longer. And the manager said, I feel like I don't have any choice but to move this person out of the organization because every other time this has happened, that's what we've done. We're looking at being consistent. We're looking at following policy where, you know, this is the right thing to do according to what we have written down and according to the documentation that we have. And if you look at it from that perspective, then that would have been the right thing to do if, if the goal and the intent was to be consistent in the application if the goal and the intent was to follow the policy and what had been written down and what had been documented as to what was our guidance. And, you know, really the discussion that took place was around, well, this employee has been a significant, successful contributor to our organization and looking at it, not just from that department or not just from that function, but looking at it from the larger picture, how do we make this a win-win for both the employee who is involved and the organization? Because the employee demonstrates our core values and demonstrates our mission and is aligned with our vision. This is someone who from the core aspect of who they are is a person that belongs in our organization. They just don't belong in this particular role. And it's taken them a while to realize that and a while for all of us to, you know, kind of come to come to terms with that as well. And so we took that and put forth a great deal of effort to work with the leadership of that department to actually move this employee 
still within that department, but into another role within that department. And so we were able to save that employee. And it was actually a positive for the employee because they moved into a role which had more positive interactions with the children in the pediatric unit. So the employee was happy, the department was happy, and from an organizational standpoint, we were able to retain someone who demonstrated our core values every single day. So that was a wonderful time um, that I could say that really turned out best for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome story. So thank you for sharing that. And I think what it, what it cements in is the way I've been thinking more and more about organizations is that we really are a family. Mm -hmm. And, and what's crazy about it is that if you think about how much time we spend getting ready for work, commuting to work, at work, commuting home from work, we end up spending even probably even more time at work than we actually do with our own families. Sometimes. Yeah. And then, so, so then it's like, if you have these people that are devoting so much time and energy to an organization, and then, you know, like you said, Oh, well, we have this policy. They got to go. It's like, but hold on a second, because this person has steadily been able to like, you know, Mm -hmm. give themselves to the organization, be dedicated, et cetera. That's why we promoted them in the first place. Just to cut them, that seems like it's a very wrong thing to do. And if you think about it from like a sibling perspective, Mm -hmm. would we do that to a brother or sister? Absolutely not. You would definitely (laughs) not do that to them. So why would we do that to an employee? So yeah, Mm -hmm. I love that of being able to find that win-win and making a people-based decision. So that's excellent. So thinking about kind of, again, back into virtuous leadership, just curious, uh, Trevon, like uh, Trevon, what, what specific virtues do you feel like you've been gifted with? What are some of those that are easy for you as it relates to kind of showing up as an HR leader? Showing up as an HR leader, I think, you know, for me personally, um, one of my, one of my gifts is communication and being able to communicate in a manner that is clear and understandable at the same time demonstrating a level of understanding and empathy with the people who I am communicating with. In HR, you do often have to deliver difficult messages and that can be a challenge and often you know, there's a tendency for delivery of a difficult message to be very short and factual. And, you know, kind of the feeling is I need to communicate this and then, you know, kind of exit the situation as quickly as possible. But really looking at how do we communicate what needs to be communicated, whether that's in written form or whether that's in verbal form, and at the same time, communicate that in a manner that understands that the people who are receiving that message may have experiences, um, different filters that they bring to the table, which may cause them to interpret that in a different way than you intended and to be empathetic and understanding of the information which may be communicated to them. Um, You know, I, I have over the years really Um, worked hard at developing that. I feel like, you know, again, as you talk about blessings that I was kind of gifted with that, but again, that's been something that I have worked very, very hard um, on developing because to me, how an organization either formally communicates or informally communicates with its employees is really most of the time a major pivot point, a major linchpin when it comes to aligning employees again with mission, vision, and values. Do they feel like they are a part of the conversation? Awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, it seems like empathy is one of those great traits that's going to be pretty critical for human Mm -hmm. resources. Oh, yeah. uh, Oh, yes. Because it's, you know, how many times, you know, oftentimes that they, the HR leader probably hires and fires more than the CEO does. (laughs) So so it's 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 constantly delivering news, whether that's good or bad Mm -hmm. and being able to do it accordingly. So, so awesome. So Trevin, how can people get a hold of uh, you and the work that you're doing? Um, uh, LinkedIn is where all my contact information is. My profile is there. So, um, if someone wants to reach out to me, 
then uh, my email, my personal email, um, as well as my personal contact information is there. And so you can go there, you can check out my profile and my contact information is there. Please feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Well, we'll have that in the show notes as well. Okay. Thank you so much for being on the Leading Virtuously podcast. So excited to, to be able to watch your career continue to blossom. And thanks again for the dialogue. Thanks so much, Christopher. I appreciate it. Uh, you have a wonderful day. Hey, Chris here. Hope you enjoyed the episode where we discussed all things going bald. <laughs> Just joking. The Leading Virtuously podcast. If you enjoyed the episode and the podcast, will you please subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify? Or you could also share it with a friend. That would be tubular. I hope you have an awesome day.